Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. There are some subtle and then some not-so-subtle changes in the American narrative regarding Ukraine. On May 19th, the New York Times editorial board writes, the war in Ukraine is getting complicated and America isn't ready. Biden pens an op-ed in the New York Times entitled, What America Will and Will Not Do in Ukraine. The Guardian has a piece, Russia is winning the economic war and Putin is no closer to withdrawing troops. The Washington Post has a piece entitled, Ukrainian volunteer fighters in the East feel abandoned. Well, what are we to make of these new narratives? Well, for insight, let's turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies uh, at the University of Houston. He is one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book has just been released and is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 18 1836, Texas slavery and Jim Crow and the roots of U.S. fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So before we get into the specifics of these pieces, and I've only mentioned a few, uh, we've heard so much about the hybrid war, winning or losing the information war. Are Garland and I correct in our interpretation of of what we are reading, that we are now seeing a shift in the in the Western narrative? Well, I think it's highly possible, and I think it's driven by events on the ground, not only events on the ground in Ukraine, particularly eastern Ukraine, where just yesterday Mr. Zelensky, the Ukrainian leader, suggested that Russia controls about 20 percent of Ukrainian territory, which may be an underestimate. Other news accounts have talked about the loss of Ukrainian troops' lives and injuries, 100 or 500, 100 deaths of troops and perhaps 500 injuries, serious injuries per day. And then there's the cost in the battlefields outside of Ukraine, speaking of the North Atlantic countries, where we all know about inflation. Uh, you know, I'm sure, that in downtown Los Angeles, a gallon of gasoline at the pump is now $8 uh, heading due north. Uh, you saw, I'm sure, the recent news accounts about Mr. Biden heading to Saudi Arabia, uh, swallowing his campaign promise, rejecting his campaign promise that he would help to make Saudi Arabia a pariah. But I think with this trip, on bended knee to Riyadh suggests that Mr. Biden and those he represents have overplayed their hand. They have sanctioned Venezuela, a major supplier of oil to the United States. They sanctioned Russia. They sanctioned Iran. They were on the verge of sanctioning Saudi Arabia. And all of this, I might add, in pursuit of U.S. dominance of that market, because the United States, by some measures, is a leading petroleum producer on planet Earth, but alas, uh, even with that exalted status, that does not prevent uh, Mr. Biden from seeking to make overtures uh, to Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto leader uh, of Saudi Arabia. And I think that those news accounts that you suggested helps to expose and reveal uh, something that one should learn at a basic course in strategy at Yale or West Point, which is never underestimate your antagonists. And certainly that is what the United States has done. Uh, we have seen, quoted ad infinitum, the remark attributed to the late Senator John McCain of Arizona that Russia was a gas station masquerading as a nation or that it was, quote, upper Volta with missiles uh, associated with a nation now known as Burkina Faso in Africa was seen as the ultimate insult. But now, to their chagrin, <laughs> they recognize what some of us knew all along, uh, which is that the North Atlantic nations, particularly the Western European nations, are heavily dependent upon Russian raw materials. A good deal of the world is heavily dependent upon Russian agriculture to the point where the a number of the European Union nations have been forced to bend the knee 
and accede to Moscow's request that they pay for these commodities in rubles, helping to prop up the ruble and helping uh, Russia to fight the inflation that has become a scourge in the North Atlantic nations. And so it seems that the North Atlantic nations uh, may have to follow the counsel and advice of former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who suggested that they try to cut a deal uh, with Moscow. And usually when that happens, it's better to cut the deal sooner rather than later. But, uh, gentlemen, if I may, I'd like to step back for a second and look at this conflict from 30,000 feet, given the fact that we are either on day 100 of this conflict beginning February 24th or, or rapidly approaching same. And as I pointed out in an article that appeared on the Black Agenda Report website, an article that I stand by, that you cannot begin to understand this conflict unless you understand the point that ever since the Western European nations led by Britain began to get fat on the plunder of the Americas and the African slave trade, there's been a basic contradiction on the European continent insofar as they, speaking of the Western European nations, were not necessarily dependent on their own, uh, hegemonic on their own continent. Uh, because even today, Russia has about twice the population of the Federal Republic of Germany, the number one nation of the European Union that has a population of about 82 million. As noted, uh, these Western European nations are dependent upon raw materials from Russia. And so approximately 200 years ago, as this was coming clear, you saw Napoleon of France seek to uh, overthrow the regime in Russia and was defeated soundly. You saw the Crimea War. A few decades later, where Britain and France sought to do the same and did marginally better. And then you had a major turning point uh, decades after that in 1904 when Britain financed Japan's attack on Russia. And then you had Operation Barbarossa, June 1941, when Hitler tried to overthrow Russia. And then in February of this year, we were marking the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Entente with China, uh, which as we've said more than once on these airwaves, is the ostensible target for the attack on Russia today. And that entente with China, brokered by Kissinger and Nixon, uh, basically helped to create this juggernaut. And the United States is now trying to undo that deal. They're trying to unscramble the egg. Uh, they realize, going back to the metaphor from Vietnam, that in order to preserve U.S. imperialist hegemony, they had to destroy it, perversely and paradoxically enough, by building up China. Now they want to reverse that deal and want all of us to pay a price, including losing our lives in pursuit of that generally unobtainable objective. You know, one of the things I found important, it, it, this is uh, from the article in The Guardian, Russia is winning the economic war and Putin is no closer to withdrawing troops. And of course, as we've been discussing, you know, there's been a change of, uh, there's been a, a change of discussion, a change of narrative. You mentioned Henry Kissinger's comment at Davos. And I, I'd like to read these two, a couple of sentences to you. When the global movers and shakers met in Davos last week, the public message was condemn, condemnation of Russian aggression and renewed commitment to stand solidly behind Ukraine. Now, I'm going to read another sentence because this is what I've been hearing from a number of sources and people that I know in Europe. But privately, there was concern about the economic cost of a prolonged war. It was also reported that Olaf Scholz said on the plane on the way over there, I will not be the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, I will, Kaiser Wilhelm, I will not drag Germany into a third world war. So it appears that that the, for all of the front there of fist shaking and and solidly standing behind Ukraine, the U.S. Um, at so-called allies or vassals in Europe are the, uh, the 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 connections between them are, are are crumbling. Your thoughts on all of that? Well, and for good reason, because the European Union is basically in a quandary. They're in a classic contradiction. On the one hand. They're dependent upon U.S. imperialism as being the guarantor for world imperialism. As we've said more than once, uh, France, in terms of its neo-empire in Africa, depends upon U.S. satellite assets, uh, not to mention U.S. backup uh, from AFRICOM at the end of the day. 
But at the same time, we recognize, per the memoir of sacked Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton, that the wing of the U.S. ruling class represented by Mr. Trump uh, sees the European Union as number two to China, as an antagonist. That's no secret. And so obviously this leads to a lot of hemming and hawing on the uh, on, on the on, with regard to Paris and, and Berlin, as represented by those remarks by Chancellor Schultz. But I think we also need to deal with another conundrum, which is that of the Democratic Party. Because if you look at the recent book by hawkish Washington Post uh, columnist Josh Rogan, speaking of chaos under heaven, he tells us what we already knew, uh, which is that Mr. Trump, during his regime, was trying to improve relations with Russia so as to focus like a laser beam with regard to China. But here you have Mr. Biden, like a drunk in a bar, taking on all comers, confronting Russia, calling for regime change, although he tries to walk that back in the New York Times a few days ago, calling Putin a war criminal, going to Northeast Asia and talking about uh, confronting China over Taiwan militarily. And we have to try to understand how it is that the party that is oftentimes thought to be to the left of the Republicans can be to the right of the Republicans with regard to bedrock foreign policy issues. And I think that the answer is crystal clear. That is to say that the Democratic Party is heavily dependent upon black voters, the Democratic Party has not won the Euro-American vote in about 60 years, perhaps longer, ever since Lyndon Johnson endorsed the Voting Rights Act, meaning that in order to prevail, they have to receive nine out of 10 black votes. But a party in a settler colonial regime based upon enslavement of Africans finds it difficult to be credible with the Euro-American majority when it's so dependent upon black votes. So it has to bend over backwards to show that it's worthy of defending this settler colonial project by being more hawkish. And, of course, that may shed light upon Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam. It may shed light on Harry S. Truman at the beginning of this era in Korea in the early 1950s. Uh, But in any case, uh, I think that it all leads back to some sober reflection on the part of black leadership, Black public opinion, black voters, black intellectuals, and certainly repudiation of the bill recently carried by Congressional Black Caucus member Gregory Meeks of Southeast Queens, chairman of the House Warren and Affairs Committee, which threatens to punish African nations that refuse to jump on the anti-Moscow sanctions train. Uh, which is very curious, since you just saw the head of the African Union, Senegalese leader Macky Sall, in Sochi, conferring with uh, President Putin, uh, reminding Mr. Putin, as Mr. S- uh, Macky Sall tries to get more uh, aid uh, from Russia, uh, about how Russia, how Africa has been reluctant to join the anti-sanctions crusade. And so here you have a, a black community that's being pu- pummeled and pulverized per buffalo, subject to disproportionate rates of police killings and the death penalty, and yet, instead of seeking allies abroad, as has been our wont over the decades, instead, we're trying to punish allies abroad. This makes no sense. It's unsustainable. It cannot stand. Staying on Kissinger's comments, and I think this is just some incredible uh, inconsistency. So Kissinger says that negotiations must get underway soon to end Russia's Ukraine war in a, in order to avoid a war against Russia itself. Now, this contradicts Biden's statement in March, where he said Putin cannot remain in power. A dictator bent on rebuilding an empire will never ease the people's love for liberty. But then he says in his op-ed of last week, We do not seek a war between NATO and Russia, and as much as I disagree with Mr. Putin and find his actions an outrage, the U.S. will not try to bring about his ouster. I mean, this is all within the span of a couple of weeks that these incoherent, inconsistent messages 
are being communicated. And when you go further into his op-ed, he says, well, we don't want a war with Russia, but if our allies are attacked, basically we will defend them. But then he sends these missiles into Ukraine or wants to send these missiles into Ukraine where Ukraine can attack Russia, Russian soil. And Putin has made it clear, if you send missiles into my country, I will attack the source from whence those missiles have come. So help me out. I'm a little con- Joe Biden's got me kind of spinning here. Uh, you know, hey, Joe, pick a direction and stay on it. Well, I think we have to return to Watergate, where you recall that given another similar spate of inconsistent statements, a uh, press secretary in the White House, Ron Ziegler, reminded one and all that previous statements were, quote, inoperative, unquote. And I think that Mr. Biden is suggesting my statements in Mar- March inoperative. Uh, the latest uh, update you should pay attention to is my New York Times Fed, which is very curious because – uh, some have been wondering uh, why he wrote this down uh, rather than give a speech to have it disseminated widely. And I think it's because Mr. Biden, like presidents before him, is a prisoner of the teleprompter. And if his teleprompter had malfunctioned, uh, he would have been mute or even worse, might have stumbled into launching World War III by yet another so-called gas. And speaking of so-called gaffes, recall that in the New York Times piece as well, he walked back the provocative statements of his Pentagon chief, Lloyd Raytheon Austin, who had said some weeks ago that the purpose of the U.S. intervention in Ukraine was to weaken Russia. And then a few days after that was calling Moscow, begging for a ceasefire. And so how do you reconcile that kind of contradiction? But I think that it's easy to understand what's going on because NATO itself is being weakened. NATO is being trapped in contradictions. NATO obviously is trying to have everyone forget what it did in the former Yugoslavia when it not only uh, bombed uh, Serbia back, attempted to bomb Serbia back to the Stone Age, but then hived off Kosovo uh, without uh, any agreement uh, from the wider community. And then, of course, NATO has a problem with regards to Turkey, the eastern anchor, which is playing hardball in terms of Finland and Sweden joining this so-called alliance because of Finland and Sweden's apparent fondness for the Kurdish minority in Turkey, the groups of which uh, Turkey considers to be terrorists. And then there are other contradictions, such as Turkey blaming Washington for the 2016 attempted coup against President Erdogan. And actually, there's probably some validity uh, to that suspicion. So Washington is trapped in contradictions. It's trapped in a maze of contradictions, which helps to explain the frequent invocation of the term, quote, inoperative, unquote, to explain away previous statements that they no longer claim. Dr. Joe Horn, as always, thank you so much for that analysis, so much for that clarity. And again, folks, the latest book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow in the Roots of U.S. Fascism by Dr. Gerald Horn. Sir, thank you. Have a great weekend. We look forward to